you know, in these places that you've seen, is there a game designer, a system designer? Is there someone, <laughs> no, like, just honestly, because, like, to the point, like, earlier, it's like all of our rules, laws are designed by people. So in these places are, is, I mean, I mean, I've never worked there, but is there someone, is there a group of people that sit down and say, Hey, you know what? Here's what the current rule set says. If we're going to architect it tomorrow, this is how we're going to get there so that we can pathway it. Are we just basically playing with a dungeon master? Who's like kind of interested, but not really just telling you half a story while drinking a beer being like, yeah, roll D20. Oh, no, you died. I, I mean, how, I, you know, and you, <laughs> you get what I mean? Like, how just, involved are these designers? I mean, is there a designer? Is it just like, you know what? No. Hamilton set it up and said, you know what? This is all you guys need. Thanks, Alexander. We made it happen. <laughs> Call me in 300 years when it destroys itself. Like, no, I, I'm just curious, you know, again, like, you know, how is it's that? so... such an interesting question it's imagine it's more like this it's been described as like this huge hairball of of stuff that has just been rolling and accumulating and nobody knows to, how to undo it so it just is the way it is so the best you can do is keep adding to it and try to shift momentum direction but you can't redesign the system i remember my dad uh, he said something interesting to me years ago because I was talking to him about trade negotiations, which, of course, he was like this uber expert. Right. When when um, Nixon sent Kissinger to Beijing to open the dialogue with the Chinese, he sent my dad to Moscow to open the dialogue with the Russians. My dad's like walking, talking institutional memory. It's quite incredible. So I asked him, like, when you negotiate, like, how does that actually work? practically. And he, he's like, in the old days, we used to get together personally. And in the in the really old days, it you had to get on a ship from London to Washington, and it took like six weeks. So you had six weeks on the deck of the ship with your negotiating counterpart to get to know them, to speak privately, to drink together. And like my dad has said on one one occasion, he was in a tough negotiation and the counterparty and he agreed that they were going to drink a ton of port and whoever had to go to the bathroom first would lose. Like that was the basis of how they negotiated this really tough point. The well, video games industry learned from that just to let you know that's how we do it right now. But go ahead. <laughs> it, now, today, why can't we do it that way anymore? Well. Freedom of Information Act. So every time more than two people who are officials meet, if there's a third person, you have to have a lawyer present. The minute a lawyer is present, now notes are being taken. Now you can't have the offline conversation about, hey, how are we going to solve this problem? You definitely can't seem to be drinking. So you can't form, I'm not saying, by the way, you can only form personal relationships through alcohol. I'm just saying it's an example of like, how do you solve problems with people? You go have a drink, right? And we have a chat. And we get that's actually we get true. Them. Cup of coffee, a tea. We can Cup always say, you know, maybe I'm sitting here. I'm living in England, drinking tea. I so. know a little tea, uh, some chocolate. <laughs> but there has to be some personal connectivity. Why did Gorbachev and Khrushchev meet? Why did um, oh, sorry um, Nixon and Khrushchev or Gorbachev and Reagan? They met privately, quietly for days in places like Iceland and Greenland, which were remote and there were no cameras, and they were actually able to get to know each other. We can't do that anymore. We can't do it between Republicans and Democrats, and we can't do it between Americans and Chinese or Americans and Russians. So this is important because then my dad's like, and the other thing is once the lawyer's present, then the lawyers are trying to hammer down all the details into very specific legal points. And he, he said, that means you can't maneuver anymore. So actually you want loose agreements, very loose, lots of flexibility. You don't want to hammer each point that it has to be exactly like this because then it's going to break the minute pressure is applied and the pressure is constantly applied. 
So you're right. Our, we don't have a designer. Although I have to say the absence of a designer is exactly what causes the whole conspiracy theory world to say there must be a designer and it must be some very wealthy, very evil person who is, you know, trying to do bad things for the planet. And Bill Gates gets thrown into this box all the time, right? He's trying to do terrible things. It's because people can't believe there's no designer, but there is no designer. And it really raises the question, like, should we, you know, go back and say, wait a minute, how many laws do we have that are just antiquated and out of date? We just don't need them anymore. Let's just clean that up. But nobody wants to do it because it's so messy. Well, so, you know, it's it's interesting because I'm, I'm reading Kissinger's book on leadership and the chapter on Nixon and Sadat. And actually, when you talked about your father and all the places he was at, I'm like, I literally have been reading about most, mm -hmm. if not all of what you just covered. And fascinating because the reality is it was all relationships. You know, the, oh. the Cuban Missile Crisis, the day it started, Khrushchev and Kennedy are talking every day. And it took to send messages. It was like 16 hours to decipher a message sent between Moscow and D.C., and in 16 hours, you can think, you have time to think, you have time to phrase a response, to scenario it out, to effectively play a game, you know, game through what is about to happen. You know, in, in the idea that there's no designer, because, I mean, I it makes total sense there is no designer. It's literally like a, a ball in perpetual motion that was thrown uh, 250 years ago. And it's continued to pick up velocity, changes course when it hits something. But it's never been unwound and it just continues to, you know, gain in mass. Do you see, as, as we get over to this next point, uh, to this next phase of human evolution and, and literally with space, do you see the current systems that we're utilizing stressing to the point where by default they default? Or do you think it's going to be something where we're like, okay, you know what, just it is what it is. We're going to have to basically change world order, change the way the economy works because, yeah, you know what? There's uh, 3 million people without a job because the AI is doing it, you know? I mean, or because there's plenty of everything, you know, abundance is here. Do you see that or is that, is, am I now in science fiction land? No, oh, no, you're not at all. Uh, and let's remember, you know, the guy who invented game theory was Tom Schelling. Um, and my dad was his research assistant. And so again, you're right. This is the heart of the matter is, is game theory. It's the prisoner's dilemma. It's the, you know, I must win, you must lose kind of thinking. And one of the most interesting things to me in my recent years is really opening up to alternative approaches, frankly, historic approaches things we've done in the past. Um, and as an example, um, one of the things you'll notice at NASA is, for, the, for example, this next round of, of astronauts that are going into space, they have a heavy concentration of people who come from indigenous backgrounds. And you're like, wait, is that just random? Is, is that just catch up because they were excluded for so long? I think it's because people who come from indigenous backgrounds, whether it's the Aborigines in Australia or American Indians, they have a kind of more community oriented way of thinking that the, it's not only about the individual, it's about as a group, yeah. how are we going to behave? And more than that, it's about, it's, it, it's based on the assumption that humans are part of nature. They're not separate from nature. We are nature. So our obligation to preserve and protect nature is inherent. Um, and, and today, because ever since Rene Descartes came along and uh, basically said, no, 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 we can separate the rational from the irrational. And we can have a world where logic wins and therefore the individual with the best logic is the winner and everybody else basically doesn't evolve right it's this kind of mishmash of darwinian 
and Cartesian thinking that has really dominated, but it's not where the younger generation is. Um, and I say this, you know, I'm very much a free market person. And I do believe that capitalism is the best system compared to all the rest for preserving the freedom and, the, and protecting the, the privacy of individuals. But I don't think that the way we're doing it is serving us best. And I think there's a big movement right now to think about a new way of orchestrating human talent. Um, and, you know, how do you create organizations that can bring about flourishing? Um, and this is like the philosophical issue of our time, honestly. No, absolutely. I think you're, I mean, you're nailing onto it because the reality is that to survive in space will require communal thinking. It will require a sense of community. It requires me caring about you because I don't want you to die because I don't want to die. It's basically realizing together we go further and we actually succeed together, which is as cheesy as it can sound in an in individualistic society. There is called oh. society for a reason. It is the collectiveness, right? And so maybe there's something here, and 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 what I'm what I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose something to you. Uh, okay. In in the in the the I guess I could say like the upper echelons of power and 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 government is maybe the idea that we start looking at some new system designers, some new game yeah. designers, who can think about it from that. What is it that I need to put in the flywheel to incentivize everyone to participate in a way in which the next. <laughs> you know, Hamilton part two basically can say, you know what, let's throw this and let's see how much further it goes and what momentum it gets, but with some definition now and maybe some measurable metrics. And uh, it's not so much winner takes all, but it's uh, society builds all, I don't know, insert whatever yeah, theme yeah. that is, right? You know, 2026, yeah. <laughs> that's whatever, whatever it needs to be. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, um, is, is it far-fetched or are we in a place where people are like, you know what, whatever, you know, let the kids have what they want. Hippies cut your hair. I don't know. Where are no, we? It's not, <laughs> it's not far-fetched. And again, going back to what you, you just said before you posed this question, you kind of said, oh, you know, you, you were implying, you know, this kind of let's love each other and this hippy dippy approach. But you know what? It's how special ops works. Yeah, exactly. Right? No, Navy right, steals. Exactly. This is how Navy SEALs operate. There's nobody left behind. Yeah. Is that you love and care for the other members of your unit more than you care for your own life. And this is really important. This definition of what it is to be um, uh, uh, in leadership and caring at the same time. Totally Simon agree. Sinek. Totally. And Simon Sinek has a really interesting little clip that you'll find on the net where he talks about um, the uh, high trust, high competence versus low trust, low competence people. And he says when he worked with the special ops crowd, he thought they only wanted the high competence, high trust people. But he found that actually trust mattered more than competence. And that the one group of people nobody wants to work with are the low trust, low competence, but even a high competence person with low trust. Yeah, this nobody wants to work with them. And can we swear on this show? Yes, Simon Sinek. Yeah, of course we can. <laughs> Literally said you, you can identify the high confidence, low trust people just by asking everyone in the room, which one is the asshole? Yeah. And, and everyone knows who it is. Yeah. So it's not crazy to think that we could have a society that maybe replicated these values, which frankly, you know, when you ask about militaries as well, I, I always say, you know, militaries are to a large extent run on love. And people are like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, well, they're not run on money. That's for sure. Right. People are not in it for the paycheck, but they are in it for their care of their fellow members of their units. And so to take that same idea into broader society, that's not crazy. So back then to your question with that in the background, um, I think we do need new systems design. Now, what's 
happening, in my opinion, is we're witnessing a massive decentralization of power. And everybody feels this. It's partly caused by the fact that every single one of us have a phone in our pocket that literally has more computational power than we needed to put a human on the moon. So everyone has a supercomputer in their hands. And this allows a flourishing of creativity and the ability to build without having to refer to a central power. So the decentralization of finance, the decentralization of decision-making, th these are powerful forces at work in society. So one of the things I see in politics is power is devolving from the White House to mayors. Cities have more power and authority to do stuff. And the more and more the mega cities are just talking directly to each other, not even going through their national leaders. And I think our next generations of national leaders are gonna come more and more from the pool of mayors. It used to come from governors in the states because governors manage big budgets, but cities are now getting bigger than states. Um, and so this decentralization phenomena means that mayors start to play in this game and change the direction of travel of that big hairy ball. Um, what's a miracle really though, particularly in the US is that the constitution has served us so well for so long. And the message it gives me is, something I learned when I worked in the White House, and I'll just digress a little bit here, but I think it's important because people always want to know what was the president like? And so I worked for George W. Bush and I was an intern, not to date myself, but I was an intern for Ronald Reagan. Like, oh my God. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Anyway. Let's forever young. Forever young. <laughs> here exactly. we go. Forever 21. Here we go. Forever 21. <laughs> or 19, maybe. Um, so... Wow. I think we have two <laughs> I think we have two kinds of presidents. There's like a spectrum. And you have your uh academic intellectuals at one end. So Jimmy Carter, Barack Obama, uh they like to read everything. They don't like to delegate. And so their inboxes are massive, their outbox is small. The other extreme is the Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush who I worked for. They make decisions based on principles. And they delegate, they're like, hey, I trust you guys, come back to me with three options that you know are aligned with my philosophy. And they don't need to get into all the detail. Um, I actually think the error rate for both types is pretty much the same. So it doesn't really matter to the outcome. But what is important is that this decision making based on principles is easier for human beings to execute on. So the more detail oriented we get in our systems design and our rulemaking, back to the point I was making about the lawyers hammering everything into place, the harder it is to adjust anything. The more we settle on what are the basic principles that we're trying to, that we all agree really matter. And as we adhere to those principles, then pretty much you can work it out. And I think people have not really thought through where do they stand on that. And a lot of people like the safety of, you know, very prescribed, precise, you know, section 43B of the law. And they want to rely on that kind of narrow framework. But as we make this leap into this new era, not just of space, but of technological innovation on such an epic scale, I think we're going to find we'll have to revert to principles more and more because you can't you you can't construct a legal framework around everything. Well, you can't know everything. You I mean, back know. just going back to the opening, every twelve hours. Yeah. It's, it's and what changing. is it now? I like, mean, that's. I what is it now? I'm like, show me the progression. It must be like getting into the nanoseconds at this point. I mean, it's insane. I mean, and so that that that's actually. That, that's a great segue in, in, from into principles and into how you govern and, and how do you see your life. And, you know, on, on BGRT, we always love to to give our listeners a, a, a kind of tips 
on on how you get to where you are. So for people out there listening to you and listening to the show right now, and they're like, I want to be Pippa. How? how? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like how? Because like, I mean, people want to follow in your footsteps. I mean, it's always inspirational to hear you talk. It's always informative. So, you know, for the people out there, our young listeners out there that would love to basically get to where you are, or at least follow along, how, what would you recommend? I mean, what would you tell someone? Well, I honestly think back to your point earlier about it's all about humans. And I think we've made a terrible mistake in trying to corral humans into career paths. And I'm like, there are no career paths, right? Like everybody's got a different road and mm, you got to forge true. your own road, right? And so people will say, oh, I want to be a lawyer. I'm like, why? Or, what, you know, or I want to be this or I want to be that. Why? And then you start to unpick and you realize they don't really. They just want a job. So one advice I have is don't start with the small thinking of a job. Start with the big thinking of if you could just design your life, you could write your ticket, you could have anything you want, no constraint. And no one has to know what you what you want. Take a piece of paper, write down what's your dream future. And when you construct that, it's so much easier to work backwards. What would I need to do to get there if that's what I want, right? Because some people, they want to lead an international life. I remember when I was young, I was like, I thought it'd be so glamorous to, you know, have places around the world and live in different cities. And, and I've done that because that appealed to me. For some people, that's a nightmare. They want to live close to grandma. They, they, they're friends from high school, right? It, everybody's constructed differently. So first thing is really imagine what the home run looks like and then work backwards. And then everything really becomes possible. I think a second thing is um, you've got to tear all the fences down. I remember my PhD supervisor, Susan Strange, who was quite a figure in political economy at the time. She said all these fences, the fence between um, physics and chemistry, uh, the fence between um, politics and economics, all these fences are artificial. And all the interesting stuff happens at the border. So take the fence down, go toward the border, and then live in that space where everything meets. And that's really fun. It's really interesting. You, it's just, so I would say do that. And finally, it's really interesting. A lot of the guys and most successful people in the world, venture capitalists, they're like, don't do what you love. You will never get paid for that. Just get really good analytical school skills and go be an investment banker and be a venture capitalist and you'll just make tons of money. I don't think that's true. And even if it is, money isn't the only thing. And if you don't figure this out, you will when you're about 40, because this is when everyone has the midlife crisis. And by the way, you don't have one. It turns out you have a whole bunch of them. Nobody tells you that. Um, and they don't finish when you're finished like, they go on for years and what it's all about is your soul does matter and your soul can you can live with you pretending and ignoring it for decades usually your 20s your 30s but by the time you hit 40 your soul is gonna leap out of your chest and say oi this is not working and so you suddenly realize all the material things you have are not serving right you right. realize that a great car can't buy you love like all these things um so you might as well pick things that make your heart sing and if you do you'll be so much better at them than the people who are doing it because they think they should that you will get paid you will get you'll attract more money it's exactly what you've done alex right like i bet when you started like the idea that you could make a living, let alone create an incredible company, gaming, people yeah. must have been like, are you serious? Oh, no, or absolutely. You no, you're, to you're totally right. You're totally, I mean, when we started, I mean, I was happy to make basically less than what someone made at McDonald's, flipping burgers. But it's because I liked what I do. And, I mean, I loved it and I still do. I mean, it's every day. I love it. That's why I keep coming back to it. And I get to meet great people like you and hear great advice. Live a life I would never 
ever think possible by having the conversation with you and hearing what you have gone through, what you have seen. It's It's been phenomenal. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, I, clearly I don't do it for the money. I do it because I love it. Well, exactly. But the money follows. And, um, and it's Very back true. to your systems design, right? It's back to your system design is actually you get to design your story. You do. You get to design your story. I remember there was a point when um, I was working in finance and I realized that some of the people in the bank were being invited to go on television, CNBC or Bloomberg or whatever. Um, and I thought, well, that sounds like fun. I'd like to be one of those people. And somebody said to me, well, you can't just go on television. Like you can't just decide. I was like, I think you can. And I did. And I did my very first interview when I was working in Hong Kong. And it was the hardest kind of interview I now know. I was speaking down a camera in a studio with no person to speak. So I couldn't see the other person interviewing me. Um, and yet, it ended up going really well and it launched a career where I was then on television for a long time. I still do television. Um, and I realized it's just a communications method. It was a way of reaching a bigger audience. People will always say, you can't do that. I say, don't hang out with them. <laughs> hang out with Amen. the ones who say you can. Amen. You're, 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 I mean, hang out with them. <laughs> yeah, well, th so this is the thing. I mean, I, I actually really hearing your story and I remember when we first met just the places you've been where I'm so certain you were the only person like you I'm sure you've always been surrounded by a certain prototype male dominant of a certain background in that area and I'm sure here's Pippa one of maybe a handful of women at that level interacting I mean, a, is that a true statement? Is that a, is that, is that, was that true or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I started in investment banking, um, like there were no women. And when I was the chief currency strategist for Bankers Trust, I was, I think there were, might have been, I knew of one other, but, you know, globally, <laughs> there was, it just literally didn't exist as a phenomenon. White House, I was the only woman on the National Economic Council when I got there. Um, and I have to say, it took me until I was really in my mid 40s before I really appreciated that I had basically become one of the guys. Yeah. Uh, because I, it was a coping mechanism. And it, it's just little things. It sounds so funny, but I remember being in a meeting in the White House once. And it was just like a small table. It was a small room. It was a big fight, right? It was a really big fight. And one of the guys literally spread his knees super wide, threw his arms over the two chairs on either side, and just took up a huge amount of physical space. And I realized he's trying to win this argument through physical intimidation. And he was. And I could see how it was it could work um, and that it, I could do it too. Cause I happen to be very tall, but I really doesn't work very well as a female. And actually it really agitates the guys. If you start trying to like lord it over them with your physical size, right? This is not smart. <laughs> yeah. Those and are the insecure I, men. Those are the men that yeah. get insecure because they see something that makes them think something else. They're just mindless. <laughs> <laughs> behavioral stupidity is what we like yeah, to call that. It's all that stuff. And I tend to wear high heels, which put me like well over six foot. And, you know, so I, I, again, you know, leadership, who's the tallest person in the room? You can win that way, but there are smarter ways to do it where you can get everybody comfortable and get alignment that's not forced. And I started to come into my, and I know this just sounds so out there, but I started to come more into my feminine energy and be like, hey, actually, this is very powerful stuff. And it's needed just to balance out the environment. And um, and I really now like I'm much more myself. Uh, and that has been very powerful. Um, and it's and it's allowed me into places. I remember on one occasion, I had an extraordinary experience where I was asked to brief 
um, some very senior people in NATO, but they didn't tell me who they just said it's, you know, senior audience within NATO. Great. So um, I was flown somewhere and I ended up walking into a room and there was like a horseshoe shaped table and every single person at this table was a man with their military fatigues on and each one had a slightly different uniform and it took me a minute to register what i had was the head of every nato army i had i had the french army the head of the belgian army the head of the italian army i had um the head of the us army they were literally around the table and in that moment i happened to wear because i wasn't I didn't know who I was going to be. I was like wearing my leather jacket <laughs> and a leather jacket, a skirt and my heels. And what was great was being able to come into that as myself yeah. and then speak just the same way that I'm speaking to you guys right now, because you know what? Like the main thing is they want you here because you bring a different perspective. Yeah. So don't try to be one of the guys and fit in, be yourself. It's not always easy, but it pays. This is so important because the games industry, as much as we're trying to be diverse and inclusive, and we've made great progress. I'm not going to hate on it. We have. From when I started till now, it's it's pretty amazing that we've, we, we actually acknowledge there's other human beings. Other genders yeah. was a huge thing. Uh, but we still have, you know, ways to go. And it's great and, and sometimes sad when I hear the stories of that, we are mirroring what other industries have gone through finance. I mean, you're talking about a time where our industry was just barely starting. We're only 40 years old and we're now trying to tackle these issues. So to hear you express very openly about what you've gone through, how you've dealt with it, how you realize the advantage is fantastic for our audience because ultimately in the end of the day, we know, this is the issue we're tackling with, and we want to hear more people who have solved it or found their own ways of getting through it. Because, you know, in the end, our industry only gets better when we have all these different voices of different backgrounds, nationalities, genders, ideologies, you know, the earth. When the earth is involved in solving something, it tends to get better than one person. <laughs> you know, at least that's what I think. That's what, well, I really appreciate you sharing. And this is my last two books on leadership were heavily about diversity of thinking. And again, this is a super sensitive area, but lots of people think they hit their diversity targets and they're going to get diversity of thinking. But I've been in rooms with hugely diverse people who all said Donald Trump will never be president. And you're like, I think it might be possible. And then it happened and they weren't prepared because they couldn't believe it. So the first thing is to really register when all of you have the same opinion, your alarm bell should be going off. And also, let me tell you about my first experience with um, a 3D immersive gaming environment. It was really interesting. It was probably like 2017 or 18, something like that. And um, I was an avatar in a space with lots of other avatars. And uh, my avatar design was very simple. It was definitely female, but it was very bland. It was, there was no sexuality to it. There was no, it was like a bob haircut, a white t-shirt, kind of actually like Sam Bankman Freed, now that I think about it. It was like, <laughs> are you of saying it was androgynous in nature? <laughs> no, or no. What are you talking about just... here? <laughs> <laughs> it, were you were you the what original sbf <laughs> yeah anyway um and there was a fire in the middle and everybody was roasting marshmallows on the fire and i came into the space and literally all the avatars started to come at me and block my view and like get in front of me and one of the avatars started they had they were roasting marshmallows on sticks and one of the avatars started whacking me with the stick. And um, I was with a friend who said, who was, who was watching all this and was horrified and said, grab the stick from the other avatar. And I'm like, 
what? <laughs> but he, I was able to. I literally disarmed the other avatar. And with that, all these avatars started to like move back. And some of them left the space altogether. And we kind of realized, oh my God, this is the first time a female being has entered this space. And it was like Lord of the Flies. I mean, it really was. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, you know, I, I was very lucky that I had that as a first experience in an immersive, fully 3D, fully physical engagement, because it made me really appreciate how combative Lord of the Flies oriented these spaces can be, but they don't need to be. They're just, uh, uh, there's an unlimited number of variations. The, the limitation is who do we have designing them? Well, that's interesting you say that because I mean, in that in that instance, the stick is the conch. That's basically what that is, you know, to bring Lord of the Flies in here. So, I mean, I think that the the part that I find fascinating with that story is that it. I think you could go to a preschool and see that yes. same thing happen, where it's like I've never been around something that's different from me, and the behavior. It, it's almost primordial. It comes down to this: like, I don't know, therefore I act unruly and. And then someone has to come and grab a stick and then whip me with it because then I'm like, okay, get in line. But you're right. The idea of a designer actually thinking through the process is exactly the point. And if that designer maybe would think about it in a different way of saying, hey, there's going to be all types of people in here. And we want them in that's here. That's exactly the point. Because yeah. crowdsourcing ideas works. Yes, it does. And we've seen this. We've seen this. I remember it was some years ago that um, I think it was Shell. I'm pretty sure it was Shell, the oil company. They were trying to fix a problem with um, how the oil moved from the well out of the well. And they couldn't fix it with their internal engineers. So they made a prize and they announced to the world, anybody can fix this. And the person who came up with the solution was a tattoo artist. Because it turns out it's the same process of the liquid trying to get through a small space. Brilliant. So we know that this diversity of thinking works. And we see this, by the way, also at NASA and at Google in the Google X moonshots. I was just listening to the, the head of that only last week. Um, and they were talking about with moonshots, it's all about bringing very brilliant people from completely different backgrounds together because this is where you create something that's never been seen before and they don't care about a 10 percent improvement in something they're like who cares they want a 10x and they expect a 10x from their moonshot projects but you can't get 10x with the same old folks you you have to take people from very different backgrounds. Same with NASA when they started to realize like um, solar sails that like what we're seeing on the James Webb uh, telescope. So they reached out to people who were couturiers, right? The, the couturiers from Paris designing ball gowns because they know more about stitching and fabric than anybody. So this is so exciting to me is this a way to bring people together and your world by the way i think this whole web3 metaverse games this is going to be at the heart of what happens in business and the expansion of the human race into these new spaces the ability to create and already test and know whether something works or not before you go build it in some remote location on the planet or out in space. The ability to bring together diverse people that can't fly across the world to meet, but now they can just like what we're doing right now on this show is it's a miracle. Here I am in London and are you in Las Vegas? I'm in moment? Vegas right now. That's, okay. that's right. Yeah. I, here we are digitally meeting like, we forget this is like a miracle that this can happen. And one of the, my best examples of how important this is, is um, the company called Hopin. Hopin is like Zoom, uh, but has more bells and whistles and uh, not owned by the Chinese. So lots of people prefer it for that reason. 
But Hopin was nothing but an idea in 2019. Now it's worth $8 billion and it has no headquarters and the team have never met. They're, they're able to get the best people from anywhere in the world because of this digital space. I'll go even a step further and say, I think our kids, they're going to be like, so when you had a brilliant idea and you wanted bright people to come together to create a company, you used to do it only in one neighborhood with people who happen to live driving distance from that headquarters building. Like, really? That's like, it's quaint, but it's kind of dumb. Why wouldn't you create a company with the brightest minds that are all over the world? And are, we'll be like, well, because we couldn't in the old days, but now you can, and people are. No, exactly. Pippa, I could talk forever, and I I want to basically have you back on the show again, because honestly, like, it's just, it's mind-bending and fantastic. Uh let me ask, is there anything that you would like to leave our audience with, like a final thought in regards to what you're seeing 2023 and beyond? Anything you'd like to leave for them to know about? Um, well, two things. One is uh, literally anyone can accomplish extraordinary things. And I keep coming back to space examples. I don't mean to, but... There was a young guy a few years ago who had an idea for capturing the sound of space. And he had an, he basically built an extraordinary microphone and wanted to deploy it in space to capture the sound of space. And a friend of mine uh, at RAND heard about this and worked with this guy and they ended up getting it onto a satellite and they got the, what does space sound like? Now, this is just some guy who just liked tinkering with microphones. It was not an expert in any way, and yet it worked. So this is true for every single one of us. This leap of imagination can happen. The hard part is making the leap of imagination. Once you decide that's what I'm gonna do, it'll just start to happen. So please, everyone, make your imaginal leaps. There's just nothing to lose. And um, second, if you want to get deeper into all these subjects, it's, you know, it's hard because number one, we're all being attacked by algorithms all the time. So like if you haven't heard any of the stuff about space I've been talking about, that'll be because you've never clicked on a space article. If you click on a few of them, the algorithms will go, oh, they want to hear about space. And suddenly you'll get a barrage of them. But it's like being corralled by, you know, sheepdogs that are putting us in a tiny pen. And so all of us have to fight that all the time. And it's really important to try to box your way out of the narrow spaces algorithms are putting you in. Because the, if you don't get out of your silo, you won't be able to do the pattern recognition that is all we've been discussing in this in this thing. So I write a column on Substack under Pippa's Pen and Podcast, and I try to help people get out of the silo, see the bigger pattern, see stuff that's coming on the landscape, be the person in the crow's nest that says, oh, wait, look over here, something interesting is happening. But well, listen, thank you so much. This is such a cool podcast and so wide ranging. I love yeah. this conversation. No, I love it. And thank you for coming on. And uh, please share your social tags. How do we follow you? How do we find yeah. you? So shout them out. Totally. So I'm under at Dr. Pippa M because no one can pronounce Malmgren or spell it except a Swede. Um, at Dr. Pippa M mainly on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, very old fashioned, I know. Um, and then the Substack column, which is just if you Pippa's pen and podcast, you'll find it right away. And uh, those are the main things. But I'm always happy to have a chat. And I'm really excited about getting more involved with the Web3 um, you know, this transition into a world that isn't reading pieces of paper, but immersed in comprehending, you know, what's happening. So I want to talk to you about that more. Absolutely. Pippa, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and expertise and your thoughts with us at Video Games Real Talk. It's been a sincere pleasure. Thank you again for coming on the show. And Thanks. Yeah, no problem. And everyone, thank you again for listening to season four of Video Games Real Talk. We are going to go into the holiday, so 
Merry Christmas, Happy New Year's. If you celebrate, if not, have a great Happy Holidays anyway. And we will be back with Season 5, which will start up sometime, I think, in January or February. The producers will tell me or they'll just cut this out. Uh, anyway, thank you again. Have a great, safe holiday time. And if you want to hit us up at VGRT, at StarveUp on Twitter, you can go ahead and comment, share, tell all your friends about it, tell us what you hate and love about it. But know that anything else that we are here to talk about, the business of video games and other ideas that help you understand just where technology in life is going specifically because it does interact with the games industry. And really, that is what this is all about. Have a great time. Thanks again for listening. We'll talk soon.